Hello and welcome to this World Lunch Wednesday talk. My name is Charlotte and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes as we take you virtually into the field uh, to Kenya with one of our scientists at the Zoological Society of London. Before we do that though, I'd just like to remind you how you can take part during the event by sending us your questions. All you need to do is go to the website Pigeonhole. So I'm sharing the link now. Um, just go to www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1960. That's www.pigeonhole.at forward slash 1960. And there you will be able to submit your questions for today's scientist. You can also, most importantly, upvote questions there as well. And that's what I will be looking out for today because I'm hoping you're going to be sending in loads of questions over the next 30 minutes. So I'm going to prioritize which ones we ask by looking at those which have got the most votes. So please do vote for your favorite questions and we will endeavor to tackle those as we go. Now, as I mentioned, we're joined by one of our scientists today, uh, and that scientist is Rosie Woodroff, coming to us live from Cornwall. It's fantastic to see you, Rosie. Thank you very much for, for coming along today. Um, and you've got a huge wealth of experience um, working in the field, so it's, it's going to be a challenge to try and squeeze it all into 30 minutes. Um, but I know you've been working for 25 years or so now uh, in East Africa, studying African wild dogs. So that's what we're going to be hearing about today um, and discovering more about how your research is helping us to better understand how these animals and people can coexist together. But Rosie, my, my first question for you is that your research Research is, is based in, in Eastern Africa, um, but whereabouts uh, is that and, and what's it like there? So most of the research I've done in Africa has been in Kenya. We work um, primarily out of uh, Impala Research Centre is our, is our base in, uh, in, the, in the rangelands of Northern Kenya. We work a lot with um, local communities and private landowners. It's the most fantastic place to work in fact yeah you can see a picture now of some wild dogs outside that re so they're reading the sign going into a parlor um and uh you know i always say when people are visiting the site that you know the weather is perfect you you wear shorts and a t-shirt all the time and vary how much you complain about whether you're hot or cold but you don't think of putting on a jumper um so yes it's this beautiful dry country all inhabited by local local people some private some some Maasai, mostly Maasai and Samburu pastoralists who have got this fantastic ability to coexist with wildlife. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a fantastic place to work uh, over the years to understand how people and wildlife can coexist. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it looks like a, a beautiful place to, to be doing field work and really interesting to be able to study animals and people very much living side by side, as you mentioned. Um, African wild dogs, though, haven't haven't consistently been been in in this area. Um, why were you? Why did you first find your, yourself in in this part of Africa? What were you doing? Sure. So um, my history was that you know I'd I'd written an action plan for African wild dogs, but that at the time, you know, the sort of deep dark secret was I'd never seen one in the wild. You know, I, I'd watched them on TV. I'd gone looking for them. I tried and tried to see them, but I never. You know, I knew you know this is an animal that lives at really low densities. They're difficult to find. Um, and then I went out actually to work on lions uh, and I was doing a very similar project looking at coexistence of people and lions. Mm -hmm. And one morning um, I was running an errand. I wasn't even in the field, really. I was just like driving on this quite busy road in, 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 in on Ampala Ranch near where that photo was taken. In fact, wild dogs have been extinct in the ecosystem for about 20 years at the time. And I was just driving along and three wild dogs jumped out of a bush, ran across the road and vanished. And I slammed on the bakes and burst into tears because I'd never seen anything so exciting in my life. That, you know, when you, when you, if I, when I say when you first see a wild dog, every single time I see a wild dog, I'm just overwhelmed by the, the incredible personality this animal has. And then right there and then I was like, right, they're coming back. And, you know, this is what I've got to do now. And, um, you know, we started fundraising for the project and were able to be right there, right at the, right at the very start. And we watched the population recover from local extinction up a, for, a, for a time to be one of the biggest populations in Africa. Wow. How, how exciting to be able to, to witness that your, yourself. And um, 
but I mean, it, it sounds like wild dogs for, for you really are quite, quite special. What makes them so unique, so much more exciting than perhaps something like a, a lion? <laughs> so, so they're all personality. They're, they have great complex social behavior. Um, if you like dogs, and I do, um, you know, they're like super dog. They are the most enthusiastic animal in the animal kingdom. Uh, everything they do, they do with this sort of energy and, and, and enthusiasm. They're, just, oh, you know, they're interested in everything. Um, yeah, every time before they go hunting, they get really excited. And they go through this process like called, called a greet or a rally, as in this case, where they run around and kind of bond together and leap over each other. So as someone, you know, I've always been very interested in, in, in social behaviour in animals as well. My background was in animal behaviour and the evolution of social, social behaviour. And uh, so they're really interesting. They're just not you know, lions sort of lie around and sleep a lot. But wild dogs are always doing something. Um, and, um, you know, I just find them endlessly fabulous to watch. Um, and you actually find that quite a lot of wild, bio wild dog biologists, you know, they start talking to each other and they all get very excited. And, um, and you know, we're, all, we're often quite sort of enthusiastic people. <laughs> Similar to, to the animals you study. Exactly. What? There's like dog people and cat people and the wild dog people are the, a particular type of enthusiast. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, Rosie, the, the questions are flooding in, which is fantastic. Um, don't forget to keep submitting them and upvoting them as well. Um, that web link I'll just quickly share with you all again is, here we go, pigeonhole.at. Oh, actually, that one's wrong. So sorry. I, I believe it should be 1960. There you go. Didn't update that from last time. So there you go. Pigeonhole.80 forward slash 1960 um, with your questions. But Rosie, the most popular one uh, so far is all about how you get into working with wild dogs. And if you have any recommendations for someone who would like to work with them in the future, what would you advise? Yeah. So the way that I did it, well, you know, I was sort of lucky in that I was, um, I was, uh, you know, asked to help, you know, a colleague who was supposed to have written this action plan and haven't done it. <laughs> um, so I was sort of in the right place at the right time. I think this is a species which is really difficult to work with. So, for example, you know, when we started the project, you know, I said about how, you know, what inspired it was these three dogs that I saw. And when we got the money then, you know, I went out and I spent six months walking around. And it took me that long, you know, until I got the first, first tracking collar on. Um, and um, definitely, um, uh, you know, try to join and establish, get some experience with an established project rather than trying to start a new one because they're a nightmare to start with. But what I would really encourage as well is if there's anybody watching this um, from within Africa, you know, it's shocking to me how few African nationals have studied this animal. I'm so excited to, ha you know, to have some, some working with me. Um, but I would really encourage, you know, they're African endemic species. They only live in Africa, you know, you know, fantastic to see more, more Africans working. Yeah. So here's a picture for, actually, this is the most recent wild dog collared on our project. So fantastic to see that this, you know, this is, um, this is a Kenya wildlife service vet and my PhD student, Dedan Ngatia, who's amazing. He's, yeah, you get him, you got me and Dedan enthusing about wild dogs in the same room. It would probably explode. Um, and, but this is so great to see this being now being being led by by African scientists. It's mm. wonderful. Well, we'll have to try that sometime, getting you both in the same room. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds fun. Um, Rosie, another popular question that's come through is all about how um, African wild dogs look and that possibly in, in Kenya and some of those Eastern African countries, they look different to the wild dogs you see in South Africa. What, why is that? That's, that's a good question. We don't know the, we know the why. Let me just let me explain mm. the difference. So the wild dogs in, in East Africa are, tend to be smaller and darker. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the, you know, they, you can see that the coat is a mixture of black and brown and white. Mm. So that one is, that's one's a particularly sort of, you know, brownish one. Mm. Um, but some of the wild dogs in, in, in Southern Africa have got a lot more white on them. Mm -hmm. um, and we're doing, so all the photographs I think you've got here actually are, are, I think these are all ones from, from Kenya. So these are mostly quite dark. You can see that they're mm -hmm. kind of black with some little white bits on. Um, but you see wild dogs in Southern Africa, which have got a lot more white. And often a lot more brown. So actually, we're doing we're doing some research at the moment, trying to understand the coat color variation. Because um, one possible explanation is that um, because um, 
in at, at higher latitudes, so further south in Africa, um, in the in the sort of the, you know you get to have a sort of distinct summer and winter, and the summers are really hot. Um, and so it may be that having a paler coat actually allows them to reflect the uh, reflect the sun. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at that, looking at whether whether it's something to do with with climate. It may also be that um, further south, when you have this fantastic um, sort of deciduous Mapani forests, that it may actually be a camouflage. Um, mm -hmm. But we don't know, and we're actually something we're researching at the moment. The jury's still out on that one. Interesting yeah. question, though. Um, and then one more before we move on. What are the biggest threats uh, that wild dogs current, currently face, in, in your opinion? And what can conservation do to combat these? Yeah. Very important so, question. So the biggest threat to wild dogs is loss of habitat, mm -hmm. um, because this is a species which ranges very widely and needs really, really big areas of, 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 uh, of land, of wildlife friendly habitat to persist. Um, one of the reasons that uh, you know that they struggle to coexist with people is um, well, there's a you know, there's a number of reasons why that you know they disappear. So yeah, here's one trying to coexist with people. They're very curious, as I mentioned. So this is he's, that man is not in any danger. That dog's just coming to have a look, but it gave the man a bit of a shock. Mm. Um, they um, they're not dangerous to people at all, but they are dangerous to livestock in some situations. So a lot of farmers, um, livestock farmers. Um, don't like them and will, will in some cases kill them. Um, one of the big threats that we have identified in, in this area is actually surprisingly in this area, although they're, they're in this area, remember this is entirely outside protected areas, they're living alongside people. Um, we thought the big problem would be predation on livestock and farmers killing them, but actually it's turned out to be disease. So I said earlier that, you know, this population became the um, you know, among the among the largest in 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 the, in the wild. I, you know, I said it became for a while because actually, what happened in twenty seventeen is we had a massive epidemic of uh, canine distemper virus, and we lost most of the study population. A few animals survived, and they're coming back now. And in fact, our first you know our first collared pack after that we call the Phoenix Pack because they're kind of coming back from the you know, recovering from the ashes. So clearly distemper and rabies are, are big threats uh, and growing threats I think um, and then actually the other threat that we've, we only just discovered is climate change so we've shown that because you can see that this is an animal that's active by day um, and in hot weather the part the, the amount of time in the day where it's cool enough for them to do these high, high speed hunts that they do mm. is less and less um, so we think what's happening is that they're actually not able to get enough food in the time that they're able to hunt and so we see at high temperature both the adults and the pups are, are, are more likely to die and so as climate change happens um, that's predicted to have a you know a worsening impact on wild dogs so have, so the, the, those are the big threats in terms of what we can do about it um, we know we're developing ways, we've developed ways to address the issue of human wildlife conflict, so of, of wild dogs killing livestock. Um, there's a lot that you can do with traditional livestock husbandry, um, you know, ways that livestock are looked after. Um, actually, the way that, that Maasai and Samburu pastoralists that we work with um, traditionally look after livestock, you know, those approaches have been developed over generations because they work. Um, so those are really, are really valuable. Um, we're doing a lot with, in, with infectious diseases. So at the moment, um, in fact, our, our, the team that I work with at Impala, they've just vaccinated 20,000 domestic dogs uh, against, uh, against rabies, which has, you know, protects those dogs, it protects people, but it also protects wild dogs. So it's a win-win for people and wildlife coexisting. Um, Stemp is a bit more difficult um, to manage, and we're doing some research on, on, on the best way of managing distemper at the moment. But um, but yes, yeah, so so you know there are definitely things that can be done, and you know we are working to to, to implement them um, both both in Kenya and to encourage them more widely. Well, understanding those those threats is is very much part of your your work and research, Rosie. And obviously, to do this, you you need to be able to to study study the dogs and 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 find out more about them. How do you do this? How do you you go about studying an, an African wild dog and and what they're up to? Sure. So when we started the project, you know, we did some really basic stuff. So, we, you know, we've gone from the simplest to the most complicated <laughs> work. So so actually those first six months, you know, I spent just wandering around, you know, looking for wild dogs footprints and and yeah, there's a footprint and uh, and and picking up poo. Um, you can learn a huge amount from poo because, <laughs> you know, 
you know, what they eat. And that's really important both to know, you know, what wild prey they want, but also to understand if they, if they're killing livestock and where they're killing livestock and so on. So that was incredibly helpful at the beginning. So that's really, really simple, basic stuff. Mm. Um, but then a lot of what we've done subsequently, we've done a lot of, of collaring them. So we use a variety of different kind of tracking collars. So this, this one is, she's wearing a GPS collar, um, and that particular kind of collar was one where that would record multiple locations every day. We could actually go in with an aircraft and, and download data or, or just look at your fighter on the ground like this, download the data. And then we know exactly where she's been. We know her activity every five minutes. Um, and so that's actually that those are the collars that we use to, to be able to look at, for example, how how hunting behavior changed on days with different weather weather conditions. And the other really important thing with these collars is they have a mortality sensor in them. So if that dog doesn't move for four hours, then um, then what we find is, uh, you know, it gives off a special signal. And we go, oh no, it's died. And we rush in and, and find it. Now, this one I'm sitting next to in this picture, this one is is not dead, it's just Good. sleeping. Um, <laughs> So that one has how you can you can just about see that that's a what so that's me sitting in the field. You can see its tail with a white tip sort of facing towards mm. my leg. Um, that dog has just been collared and it's uh, it's just I'm waiting to make till its breathing gets to a certain point before I reverse the anaesthetic that's been used on it. Um, so, yeah, so we dart the wild dogs in order to capture them. Oh, yeah, here's a dart flying through the air about you can see that dog got pretty clueless expression on its face. It doesn't know that that dart's about to hit it. Um, and this has been the main way that we do it. And actually, it's 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 surprisingly effective. The um, wild dogs, you know, they're incredibly elusive. They live at low densities. They're really difficult to find. Mm. But when you do find them, they're surprisingly unafraid of vehicles. Um, so, well, you know, I've, I've had packs of wild dogs, which we know are living entirely outside protected areas and, and, um, and far distant from roads. And then they're not something which normally would see vehicles. But where we've had a sighting, we've actually been able to creep in, you know, off road, bumping over in a vehicle. If we can get to them, often they're completely calm and you can get right up within 15 or 20 metres and dart them. To, mm -hmm. to put collars on which is you know I spent a long time trying to understand why wild dogs were so endangered and I think that's part of it is that you know they're very curious they're very bold mm -hmm. um so if you think for example of I actually you know what when I worked on lions one of the challenges with lions is that that they live at higher densities but where they've been persecuted where they're being shot at a lot they become very shy but wild dogs don't. They, you know, in fact, I've, I, you know, I've talked to old ranchers who say, oh, I shot a whole pack of wild dogs here in 1950. Um, and, you know, I shot the first one and then the other ones just come to look. So I shot the next one, you know, you can get a whole pack that way. And actually it works with darting too. You dart one dog and that one goes down. And then the others are like, oh, she's relaxed. And they just stay with it. And then you can dart another one. And so, you know, I think that's part of it, that that sort of behavior, that personality mm. is part of their downfall as well. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but at least it does mean as, as a researcher, once you found them, it, it makes your your work slightly easier. Bit, I'm yeah. guessing not all uh, large carnivores uh, in, in Kenya are, are the, the same. You, you mentioned with with lions and some of the other animals. Is it is it? dangerous um at all rosie when when you're working so closely with some of these animals sure so working with wild dogs you know i don't think i might i might be stupid but i don't think there's ever been a time when i've been afraid of a wild dog they're just um you know i mean i, I mean i do recall a time once when i darted uh back i don't dart myself anymore it's all the the rules changed and all the vet all the darting now is done by Kenya Wildlife Service veterinarians, but in the past, uh, I was I was permitted to dart them, and I darted this wild dog, and I had a photographer with me, and I was about seven months pregnant, and I kind of lumbered out of the car and and tried to pull this female out from under a bush, and um, she was an alpha female, and the photographer who was with me didn't come and help. I was a bit annoyed, but you know. And then when I, when I finished working, the photographer said, well, yeah, I'm really sorry that I didn't come and help you. But, you know, the alpha male was right behind you. And I got some amazing photographs. So, you know, they'll come up and look. But, they, you know, I've never, you know, I've never been afraid of one. I've never been threatened by one. And, and generally speaking, local people are not afraid of them either. Mm. Um, obviously, that's completely different. You know, when you're handling wild dogs, your big concern is not to harm it. But when you're handling lions or leopards, you know, your big concern is it not harming you. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly in my days of working on, on big cats, 
I did some some things which were quite dangerous. And I think probably my worst one um, was the first time I trapped a leopard. So we developed a way of catching lions using what are called foot snares. So it's a way of a way of actually developed for catching bears where you basically have a thick, very flexible, thick cable. It's thick enough that it doesn't like cut the skin or anything. Mm. Um, and you kind of bury it uh, um, and you tie one end to the tree and you have this sort of noose on the ground and you, you set it all up. So the animal, you encourage the animal to come to a bait and it steps on the thing and it throws this noose up and it's caught by its wrist. Uh, and that worked really well with lions. We had quite a lot of lions that worked really, really well for these very shy lions that don't let you drive up to them. Um, and, um, and then there was like, well, could you actually, you know, could you catch some leopards? And, um, you know, we checked and it, it was, there was a, there was a you know, valid reason for, for doing it and it was on the research permit and so on. Um, so I was, you know, in, encouraged to, to try and trap a leopard at this tree where leopards had been baited for a lodge. And I went and looked at it and, I, you know, bear in mind, this is a long time ago and I was young and stupid and, um, you couldn't drive to it. And the first rule of foot snaring was always with lions, you know, always use a tree you can drive to. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, yeah, I've done a lot of lions and, um, you know, lions, they just, they just sort of sit there. Oh, you know, they're frightened of you when you go up to them, but they just sit there and it's going to be tied to a tree and it's not very far from, you know, from where I can get to. And, you know, leopards just like a little lion, isn't it? Not knowing, you know, as much about leopards as I do now. So I'd be fine to have you give it a go. And then we went in and I, you know, I went in, I, I had a dark gun and I was, I had a colleague with me who had a proper gun or like a real gun. And I walked behind him um, and we got up to this leopard and that we'd caught and it was not rather than caught, you know, by its front leg, it was caught by a back leg. So it could move a lot further. Mm -hmm. And it, um, it was a very tiny little female leopard. She only weighed, you know, 22 kilos. So let me know, not more than a reasonably small dog. Um, and but she was really angry. And, and I was like, hang on a minute, I said, I don't have to be right up. And I, and I, I was so nervous the first time my dart missed her. So I went back and I made another dart and I darted to like a hit her, but the dart pounced off, which doesn't happen very often. So like, oh God, and the leopard's getting more and more angry. And I went back and I made two darts. I've got to get it right this time. The only way this animal's coming out of this trap is if I get it out. Mm. So I go in and I go behind the guy with the gun. He's got a proper gun on it. And I, I'm behind him, sort of going behind him with the dart gun. And I shot her again. And the second dart bounced off. You know, it was like, oh my God. And the foot, you know, so now this leopard's really, really angry. And she's just coming again and again at the end of her foot snare, um, stretching out and pulling on her back leg, you know, running at us and then being sort of stopped by the foot snare. And, um, and all I could see was eyes and teeth and, you know, and you need a muscle to dart. So eventually I said to my colleague with the gun, you know, this isn't working, you know, what's got to happen is you've got to get her to come to you and I'll be on the side and I'll be able to get a muscle. So... So we did that and she she went here at him. I got, got her thigh and I whacked the dart, hit her for the fourth attempt. And of course, what happens is she turned and came to me, came at me. Um, and um hit the end of the you know, hit the end of the foot snare and then it's calmed down and then passed out. And I said, Oh, thank God, that's him. And then I walked up to her, and the foot snare was around two toes. And, um, you know, she was on the point of coming out mm. and, um, yeah, I didn't do that again. Um, you know, it was, you know, I didn't, I just didn't know just how, you know, how much more aggressive leopards are and what the risks would be. Mm. And so ever since then, every now and then, you know, we've, we've been trying to, we, for example, we did a lot of sampling of swatted hyenas, trying to look at disease reservoirs for, for wild dogs, trying to understand where the distemper in Carabies were coming from. And every now and then we would catch a leopard um, and whoever I was with was like, oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, we're so lucky with that. I'd be like, oh my God, not another leopard. A lot like, of respect for them now. Because, yeah, because, you know, they're really, really, you know, mm. they're the most dangerous animal I think I've worked with. Gosh. Um, okay, well, um, let's <laughs> see how many more uh, viewer questions we can get through. We've got a lot, um, Rosie, I think we've clearly got a lot of budding zoologists uh, watching who are really keen um, to, to get into this area of work. So, so very briefly, because actually what I will say is there's lots of information on our website. So if you go to zfl.org, 
www.thepodcastcollective.org and if you search for uh, careers, um, experience, anything like that um, amongst our blogs we've got quite a few blogs from our scientists and conservationists talking about their own careers and how they got into it so do have a look in particular at our blogs because you'll find lots of, of advice from all sorts of different people there um, but yeah Rosie what what kind of tips would you give on how to get into a job uh, within conservation and and studying large mammals? Sure. So, so I would say obviously we you know we're based in the UK. Um, don't you know? You know, studying large animals in Africa sounds really amazing and exciting, and romantic. But that you know, also you know, get experience in other stuff as well. So, for example, you know, I did my PhD on badgers, mm. um, and I did that deliberately. I'd done some overseas work, but I wanted you know, to become a better scientist. And I felt I could do that better by studying in the UK. Um, and um, so definitely, you know, get, get, take opportunities to get field experience on, you know, other less, you know, less dangerous or exotic things as well. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if you're in Africa, you know, this, you know, this is your native wildlife. And, and, and I think, you know, there, there really rightly should be more opportunities for African scientists to do this. And certainly, you know, when I get approached by, you know, by Kenyan prospective Kenyan students and stuff, I'm really, you know, much more um, encouraging because that's a massive deficit. You know, there's a lot of, lot of African experts on elephants and rhinos and things, but not so much on large carnivores. So, um, so I definitely encourage that. But I think, you know, if for, for people based in, you know, in other, you know, in the UK or in other countries, then definitely get experience with your own local wildlife as well and kind of build up from there. Um, and it's all that, lo it's all that local knowledge can can be really important mm. too, Rosie. And I, I know why, you know, that's one reason why you're so keen to, to see more people sort of living in, in that area, get involved in the actual research of, of these animals as well. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And especially for species like this, where what we're trying to understand, you know, is coexistence with people. You know, I, I, you know, I grew up in Cornwall. I can't go out to Africa and tell people how to look after their goats. I mean, that's just wrong. <laughs> um, you know, I've never had goats or sheep, and I, you know, I, I am. So I think you know we're very keen to to engage and have you, know, you build upon that local knowledge and that local experience and that sort of validate that 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 that, that experience as well. Um, but, I think that, but, that, that, but actually one of the amazing things that has happened is that I you know, came back to the UK and I work still work on badgers and I work in coexistence of farmers and badgers here and it's mm. and it's wonderful again to be, actually feel that this is this is my wildlife and this is something you know this is something I kind of have more of a right to to make recommendations about mm. and I think what you were saying there probably reflects on one of the other questions that's uh, come through about how important it is um, for local Kenyan communities sort of how important they are in in wild dog conservation and um, because are they quite supportive of the work that you're doing do they want to see this animal continue to exist in this area yes i mean you know it's mixed so you know this is a conflict species they're not the easiest animal to live with and there are certainly people that really hate them um, and people that love them i mean there's a wonderful story among the uh, the samburu uh, people that we work with that um, when young men come of age, they have this sort of coming of age ceremony and they're not allowed to go out after dark. And the lo this, this local story I was told was that once there was a group of boys who broke the rules and they went out after dark and they were turned into wild dogs. And that's where wild dogs came from. And that's why they have black skin in, Af in East Africa, like people do. Um, but this idea, this sort of perception of them as sort of naughty, bo disobedient, naughty boys, you know, really kind of ties in, in my mind, with, you know, with the personality of the animal. I think it's a really quite insightful kind of folk story that I, I really like. Mm. Definitely. Well, Rosie, we're coming right to the end of the event. So I'm going to pick one final question to, to ask, which is an interesting one, because it says, how has the increased population of wild dogs affected other species in the area? Um, and, and does that mean that, yeah, other, other carnivores have sort of suffered because there's, there's this other carnivore present or, or actually is it all OK? Yeah, that's a really good question. So no impact on other carnivores that we can we can divine. Um, Wild dogs are more the victim in interactions with lions and hyenas rather than the other way around. Um, it did have an impact on dick dick. So in this area, the dwarf antelope, the dick dick, um, 
lived at incredible densities. And when they first came back, you know, they could have more or less opened their mouths and filter feed on dick dicks. The density was so high. Uh, dick dick densities did go down in response to the world of recovery. Um, but actually, there was someone who, uh, a colleague of mine called Adam Ford, who was studying dick dick impacts on vegetation and couldn't it, it didn't have any sort of broader ecological impact in terms of you know causing a sort of cascading impact on on the plants that dick dicks are browsing so there's an ecological impact but um you know not a not a not a mass not certainly not a negative one mm. Good, good. Well, um, I'm afraid that is all we've got time for. Um, but thank you so much for your questions. And we're going to take the top five most popular remaining questions. And I'm going to send those to Rosie straight after this event. Um, and she will answer those and we'll be posting the answer to those questions on our blog in the next couple of days. So do look out for that. We'll tweet the link. Uh, we'll add it on Facebook. Um, and I'll also add it to the details underneath the recording of this event too, so that you can find out more. But thank you so much for sending all of your questions and Rosie thank you so much for for giving us an, an insight into your your field work and experiences out in Kenya sounds absolutely fantastic and um, as always, we're really um, keen to hear your feedback about uh, these Wild Lunch Wednesdays events. So I'm just going to share one final link with you, uh, which is our to our survey monkey. So please, please do let us know what you thought of today's event. The uh, details can be found at surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash wild lunch. That's surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash wild lunch. It's a short survey. It really won't take any more than uh, five minutes tops, um, but it does really help us in planning future events and, and understanding what you would like to see more of. Speaking of which, details of all of our upcoming events can be found on our website at zsl.org forward slash science forward slash events. Wild Lunch Wednesdays happen every fortnight, so there'll be another one in two weeks time when we're going to be talking about wildlife a little closer to home in the UK and what you can find around our coastlines. So please do tune in for that and uh, make sure you don't miss it by subscribing to our YouTube channel. But for now, thank you very much for joining us. Bye bye.